when this sermon series is over, I look forward to never hearing that song ever again. <laughs> Y'all doing all right? Well, we're in the second week of our sermon series, Games We Play, where we're using some different popular games to kind of be an illustration or a picture for us of how we can grow in our relationship to Jesus. And this week, we're using the game Apples to Apples. Who's, who's played Apples to Apples? Yeah, quite a few of you. It's a pretty simple game. You all get seven cards, and on that card is a word. It's a noun, usually a proper noun, like a famous celebrity or a historical figure, maybe a famous place. And then one person will draw an adjective card, and that will have some sort of adjective on it, and they will then show everybody the adjective card, and then everybody will secretly turn in a noun card that hopefully uh, compares to the adjective card, and they're supposed to pick who, whatever card compares best to the adjective card. Now, usually what happens is they pick the card that's the funniest, it makes the funniest comparison, even if it's not the closest comparison. Well, let, let's try that real quick. Let's, let's play uh, a couple of hands together. Uh, so here is the adjective card that gets played. The word is risky, and so we're looking for things that compare to risky. And so here are our noun cards. The Bates Motel, a wood chipper, Cuba or my high school prom. Those are some risky things. So let's, let's do by applause which one you think is m- the most risky. Bates Motel. You can, tell who, yeah, you can tell who the older people are that saw that movie. It's pretty risky. A wood chipper. Feels risky. Yeah, you don't want to stick your hand in a wood chipper. Cuba. All right, we got, yeah, I didn't know about that one. And then my high school prom. Yeah, yeah there we go. All right, let's do one more. Let's, let's do comical. So your adjective is comical, and now you're trying to compare a noun to that word comical. So here they are. A bad haircut, my family reunions, my, you know, somebody's clapping before it's even time, my bank account, and my grandpa. So who thinks it's a bad haircut? Bad haircut can be comical. Just look at Sean. Um, oh, I didn't even take that shot at him first service. My, my family reunions, if you've been to one of mine, yeah. Bank account, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and my grandpa. Oh, that's a, hopefully grandpa's funnier than that. But anyway, that's how the game works. And in the game of apples to apples, making comparisons is a good thing. It's what you're supposed to do. But the problem we have is that we also make these same comparisons in our life, and that so often gets us into trouble. Well, if you've got your Bibles or your Bible apps, turn those uh, to the book of James, the first chapter. This book or this letter was written by a dude named James. That makes sense. But more important than that, he was the half-brother of Jesus. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. And what's so interesting about James and Jesus' other half-brothers is none of them believed that he was the Messiah or the Son of God until after he rose from the dead. But I guess when you walk out of your own grave, it kind of changes people's perspective on who you are. And so after Jesus rises from the dead, James is all in on being a follower of Jesus. And he writes this very difficult book of the Bible that really challenges us about what it looks like to be a true follower of Jesus. And in James chapter 1, he's talking about temptation that leads to sin. So let's look at that together. This is James 1, 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So James here is talking about how temptation entices us in and leads us into sin, which ultimately leads to death. And a lot of scholars think that James is actually making a fishing analogy here. So the fish is lured in by the lure, right? He's enticed by the lure. Then he gets caught by the hook, and ultimately he's dragged away by the line and winds up being fish sticks in a cafeteria somewhere. And so the same thing can happen to us with respect to temptation and sin, We're lured by temptation, then we get hooked if we're not careful, and ultimately we are dragged away by sin. 
And, and if you think about a fishing lure, that actually makes a lot of sense as an analogy. I, I grew up in rural northeast Texas, and so I did a lot of freshwater fishing growing up. And I had a big toolbox full of different lures. And so one day a red uh, worm might not catch a bass, so I'd have to change, and a purple worm might. And I had this big tackle box that had all these different lures that looked different. Some looked like small fish. Some looked like insects. Some looked like worms. The one thing that all of these different lures have in common is that they all have a hook. And, and that makes sense because we are tempted by different things. There are things that may be a temptation for you that is not really a temptation for me. And things that I'm tempted by, lures that can attract me that don't really attract you. And so then if we think about it, the lure is temptation, and then we can be hooked and then dragged away by sin. But I want to talk to us today uh, about a particular sin and a particular lure or a temptation that I think catches a lot of us. It is the lure of entitlement that ultimately leads us to the hook of comparison, and then if we get hooked by comparing ourselves to others, then we're dragged away by the sins of pride and envy. And, and my hope and my prayer is that by looking at this together, hopefully we can recognize that lure so that we can avoid the hook and then not be dragged away by this sin. But it all starts with this lure of entitlement. The lure of entitlement is such an attractive temptation for us. It, 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 it's such a, a, a beautiful thing. It sounds a whole lot like the American dream. It comes from the greatest marketing slogan of all time. It's even written into our U.S. Constitution. It says that every American is entitled to the pursuit of happiness. But, but what does that even mean, really? And, and this attitude of entitlement has gotten out of hand. Historian Daniel Borston suggests that Americans suffer from all too extravagant expectations. In his book, The Image, Borston makes this following observation about us. He says... We expect anything and everything. We expect the contradictory and the impossible. We expect compact cars, which are spacious, luxury cars, which are economical. We expect to be rich and charitable, powerful and merciful, active and reflective, kind and competitive. We expect to eat and then stay thin, to be constantly on the move and yet ever more neighborly, to go to a church of our absolute choice and yet feel that church is guiding influence in our lives, to have God over us, to revere God, and yet to be God. Never have a people been more the masters of their own environment, yet never has a people felt more deceived and disappointed, for never has a people expected so much more than the world could offer. See, this lure of entitlement is such an attractive lie that if we can just get more stuff, if we can get more wealth, if things can go our way a little different, then we'll be happy. That if we can just get that perfect car that we see in the commercials, then we'll be the guy that comes out of his house in the morning and there's like 10 beautiful girls uh, getting the car ready for him to go. Or, or we'll be the family that lives in that perfect house that's zoned to the right elementary school so that our kids can have success and our kids can go to all the right different schools as they grow. Or maybe it's more simple than that. Maybe it's just to get that next video game system. Maybe it's the PlayStation, I don't know what is the latest one, 205 or whatever the, the latest PlayStation is, or the Xbox or Switch or whatever it might be. And so we save and save for that next big thing. Or, or maybe we can't wait long enough to save. And so we put it on a credit card because uh, that's not really money anyway. So we don't have to worry about that. And then we get it. And then suddenly it doesn't bring us the, the pleasure that we hoped it would. It, it kind of old, and now there's a new one out that's got something that yours didn't have, and now you want that next thing, and so you lose your joy. And I remember as a kid, the excitement of Christmas morning is I'm tearing through all my presents, opening the next gift, and man, it was awesome. There's this happiness and excitement about the newness. By lunch, Christmas Day, I'd usually already broken one of my toys at that point, and then by late afternoon, I was a little disappointed because it was all kind of old, and I wanted to play with something else. And, and that also happens to adults. Now, how many of you guys have already taken a gift back because it wasn't the right size or it's already broken? How many of you guys are still excited about your Christmas presents? We, we chase after that next thing. And then we need something to take that thing's place. 
This ad- entitlement attitude doesn't just happen. We, we learn it from other people. We aren't born with it. We look at our friends. We look at our family, and we see it in them. We look at television, and we see it from celebrities and, and athletes and the people that we look up to, and we learn this attitude of entitlement. Even from the commercials teach us this attitude of entitlement. Think about how a commercial works. A commercial plays on your attitude of entitlement. It just does. It says you deserve the good life. And all you need to get the good life, whether that's uh, having the right girlfriend or boyfriend or getting to go to all the right parties with with good-looking people or maybe it's just sitting on a beach by yourself in paradise, all you need to have the good life is to buy this product. And you want to buy it now. No, no, you don't want it. You need it. And you need it right now. And that's how it plays on our sense of entitlement. But then our sense of entitlement is never satisfied. We all know athletes and celebrities who have gone into bankruptcy, even though they made millions of dollars every year, because they just were constantly chasing what other people had, and it put them in bankruptcy. Who who knows who John D. Rockefeller is? Yeah, he is the founder of Standard Oil Company, and that was back in the early 1900s. And John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in modern history. He is the wealthiest American that has ever lived because he was a billionaire back in the early 1900s when a billion dollars was a lot more than a billion dollars is now. And so he had all this money, and yet one time he was walking and a reporter said, hey, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. And, and, and Rockefeller had all that money, all that wealth, and yet he struggled with anxiety and depression. And he was constantly chasing after the next thing. He probably should have read Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 12. Here's what it says. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to their owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. It's this attitude of wanting the next best thing. And it, and it struggles, it causes us to struggle with this sense of entitlement. But God wants something very different from us. He wants us to have lives that are free from the stress and the worry about finances and money. He wants our marriages to be free of the biggest fight that affects American couples, and that's fighting over money. He wants us to not have mounting debt that brings us down and steals our joy. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 5.19 says. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possession and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil or their work, this is a gift from God. It's a gift from God to find contentment. God wants us to have joy where we are. He wants us to have contentment with what we have. But we're so attracted to this lure of entitlement. And then what happens is, once we're attracted to this lure of entitlement, we're so often caught by the hook of comparison. Like, once we know that we are entitled to the very best, we know we want that, but we got to figure out what the very best even is. In other words, what is it that we're entitled to? And so we look around at other people to see what it is that we deserve. We look at people on TV and in the movies, but we also look down the street in our neighborhood or down the row in our church. See, these comparisons seem so natural to us. I mean, how can we really know if we're winning the game of life unless we know what the rules are, what the standards are? And so we look around at other people to see if we're winning. And I think about the words of the great philosopher, Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights, who said, and I quote, if you ain't first, you're last. I can't believe I just quoted Ricky Bobby in a sermon. I've hit a new low here on Sunday mornings. But that's so often how we think. We, We think that if we're not first then we're last. And so we're chasing after being first, and we compare ourselves to other people. And there are two different kinds of people that we compare ourselves to. We first look at the people that we see as having more than we do. And I'm not just talking about money and and stuff. I'm also talking about we compare our spouses to them. We compare our children to them. We compare our jobs and our success and our looks. 
We compare all of these different things to each other. And then we also compare ourselves to the people that we think have less than we do. But there's some real dangers in playing this game of comparison. This game of comparison gets us into big trouble when we begin to do that. And one of the things it does is it it causes us to buy into this lie of Satan that we're not enough. And this lie causes us to stymie our courage and lose our confidence. And and this, this lie of Satan that we're not good as the next person even happened to some of the great Bible characters. Think back in Exodus chapter 4, what was one of the reasons that Moses gave to God for why he couldn't leave, lead the Israelites out of Egypt? He says in verse 10, here's what he says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. How did Moses know that he wasn't eloquent? He looked around at other people and went, wow, that dude's really funny. Wow, she can really speak well, and I can't. And and so he decided that his gifts and his talent are what mattered, and that he came up short when it came to leading the people. And and the same thing happens to us today. We, We look around at somebody else and see that they do something or we think better than we do. We may think, man, I can never teach like that person teaches. I can never sing or play an instrument the way that person does. I can never do serving the way they do. And then we let ourselves off the hook because we think, man, I can never do it as well as he does or as she does. So I'm just not going not gonna to serve in that way. What you've done is buy into the lie of Satan, that God wants you to have the best abilities and talents and serve like someone else. That's a lie. God doesn't need you to have the best ability and talent. God is God, and he gave you exactly the talents and the gifts that he wants you to have to serve him and to bring his kingdom to the place that he wants it to. God knows all your insecurities. He knows every one of your weaknesses, and yet he designed and created you specifically to carry out a purpose, and he did that before you were even born. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God uniquely designed you. He uniquely made you to fulfill his purpose. He doesn't need you to be the best in your mind at whatever it is. He has uniquely gifted you in a way that's different than everybody else to serve him. Don't let yourself off the hook with this comparison game and think, man, since I don't do it as well as she does or he does, I don't have to do it. God is the one who gives the gifts. Remember that. So comparison is the hook that snares us, and comparison causes us all kind of problems all on its own. But it so often gets even worse. When we're enticed by the lure of entitlement and then we're caught by the hook of comparison, so often we're then dragged away by the sins of envy and pride. You know, envy is one of the most unpleasant sins there is. Here's why I say that. There are some sins, let's be honest with one another, there are some sins that are fun in the moment, but later that leads you to consequences. It leads you to guilt and struggle with different things. But in the moment, it's fun. The sin of envy is horrible because it makes you miserable even while you're committing the sin. Listen how the Bible says this in Proverbs 14.30. It says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. In other words, it is a miserable place to be. Envy at its heart, or the definition of envy, is being unhappy about the success or the prosperity of someone else. Look, most of us want other people that we like to have success, and we want them to be happy. We want them to have stuff but we just want what they have, and then we want it, right? We want more than they have. If somebody else is pretty, we want to be prettier. If someone else is smart, we want to be smarter. We want to be better, richer, skinnier, successful-er than other people. We don't even know what we're entitled to until we look around and start seeing what other people have. And then we get envious of them because they have more er than we do. We think we deserve more er than Bob at work because, you know, I work harder than Bob does. And 
I'm a better employee than Bob does, so why does he have more er than I do? We, we, we get envious of Bob's office or his cubicle because we realize Bob's office has four square feet more than ours does. We were perfectly happy with our office before we realized that Bob had more er in his office than we do, and now we're not happy. We're not contented with our office. We look at a brother or a sister in our family and think, man, they have a better relationship with my parents. And, and so we get jealous and we get envious of that. And secretly, we find some happiness when they have a falling out with our parents or they have a big fight. We're happy when Bob gets in trouble with the boss. We look at our friends and we get jealous because we think they have more err in a particular area than we do. And, and so we find ourselves secretly being happy when things don't go well for them. Now, we would never say that out loud. Of course not, because we know it's not right. We, we, we don't say it, but we've all thought it. And it brings up this question, how can we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to have that kind of love, how can we have that attitude where we secretly find happiness when people we love and care about have problems? It's not that we just we don't want them to be happy or have success. We just want to be happier and successfuler than they are. This sin of envy, it can even invade our church. I've seen churches where people get uh, upset and they leave the church because they didn't feel like they got the appreciation that somebody else got or they didn't get the responsibility that someone else got. And so they get disappointed and they just give up and leave. Have you ever gotten disappointed in an organization or a church because you didn't feel like you got the appreciation or the respect that someone else got? Have you ever gotten upset that you didn't feel like you got responsibility that somebody else got that you thought you deserved? I love what Ecclesiastes 6.9 says about looking around to see what we don't have and getting upset by that. This uh, is King Solomon that said it. And he says, better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So King Solomon was the wisest man that's ever lived. He had more err in his life than we ever will. He was the richest man of all time. He had hundreds of wives and concubines. He had anything he could want. And yet he wrote these words and said, better to be content with what you have than constantly going around trying to see what other people have and then being disappointed. He said it's like chasing the wind. And that makes sense because no matter how hard you train, no matter how fast you run, you'll never catch the wind. And the same is true about this comparison game that causes envy is there will always be someone that has more than you in whatever area that is. And so if you're chasing after it, you're, you're never going to catch it. We spend so much time comparing ourselves to others and then we get envious because we don't have what we think we should have, that we lose contentment. We, we lose joy in all the blessings that God has given us in our life because we are chasing the next thing. We lose joy in our work, our family, even attending church. We get so caught up in the credit we didn't get or the thing that we deserve that we didn't get that we just kind of walk away. God wants us to be free from this sin of envy because envy robs us of our joy and our peace. But it also tears down organizations and it can keep the church from accomplishing its mission. I don't know who said this quote, but it's absolutely true. It says, an organization can accomplish amazing things when no one cares who gets the credit. No place is that more true than in a church. But look, I want to let you guys off the hook a little on this sin of envy. I, I'll tell you, I struggle with the sin of envy as well, and I uh, look around at other people and get envious of what's going on and compare myself to them. But you know, now that I'm looking out at you guys, I feel better about myself in this sin of envy. I kind of feel like I'm not as bad as some of you guys. And, and that's the other part of this hook is pride. We've talked about envy, but what about pride? See, we don't just compare ourselves to the people who have more than us. We like to compare ourselves to the people that have less than us. And sometimes we even talk to them about it. We like to kind of let them know that we've got more err in our lives than they do. My favorite is, is two moms talking about kids because it's usually funny. Like one mom will say, we are so proud of little Ricky. You know, he's four years old and he's already reading children's books. Another mom will just smile and she'll say, well, that's sweet. 
You know, we've got uh, our son, he's reading the works of Charles Dickens right now, and he'll turn four next month. <laughs> Moms, be honest, you've had this kind of discussion, maybe not those exact facts, but you've had that discussion about your kids with another mom. And it's really not about our kids at all. It's about us. It's letting them know our kids are better than their kids. It's that we have more er in our life. And, and you know, the mom thing is funny, but we do this in so many different areas of our lives where we look out at other people that we think have less er than we do, and then we get all puffed up with a sense of pride about what we've accomplished or what we've done or the things that we've acquired. And that is pride. Pride is an incredibly dangerous sin. God gave us our talents. He gave us our abilities. He gave us the things that we use to make money. And then we use those things to bring glory to ourselves rather than bringing glory to God. And we also don't give God the credit for giving us that. We so often take the credit for our success. He gave us our minds that help us to accomplish what we do. He gave us our work ethic that helps us to be successful. He even put you in a time and a place for your talent to matter. Think about this. If you're in computer programming and you're good at it, how useful would that skill have been if you were born in the Middle Ages? God gives us those abilities and those talents and those opportunities. Those are gifts from God. Listen now, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. This is the Apostle Paul, and he says, For who makes you different than anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Paul's calling us out for our sin of pride here. He's saying all of those things are gifts from God, and yet we act like they're ours. We don't own anything. God gave us all of those things. He gave us our physical appearance that you're so proud of. He gave us our gifts and our talents that help us be successful. But our tendency is to overestimate what we bring to the table and minimize God's contribution. Like, I'm going to be real transparent with you guys. I, I've told you this before, but th this area of pride really is my biggest struggle. It, it's something that, that I have to keep a watch on, that I have to constantly check myself to make sure that I'm not letting it get the better of me. And sometimes it, it still gets the better of me. But, but here's the good news for me in the sin of pride. Pride is not a sin that Americans take too seriously because we want to pull ourselves up with our own bootstraps. We want to be competent. We want to be capable. We want to have strength and ability. And so we kind of let each other off the hook on this sin of pride. I mean, just imagine if I came into church and I got up here and I said, I want you guys to know that, that I really struggle with the sin of lust. In fact, I'm checking a couple of you out right now. You'd be offended by that, and you should be. You probably wouldn't come back to this church next week, and you shouldn't. And yet, with this sin of pride, we, we kind of just don't take it all that seriously. We don't take it seriously, but God takes it very seriously. Look at it, just a couple of scriptures that the Bible talks about. Proverbs 16, 5 says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Think about what that says. This doesn't say God hates pride. He says God hates the prideful. I don't know about you, but I don't want God hating me. Look at this other one. It's Proverbs 29, 23. Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. And then Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. Again, that's a pretty bad word there. A haughty spirit before a fall. I could have pulled another 20, 30, 40 verses that say pretty much the same thing. God hates the sin of pride. And here's why. Because when we're prideful, we're kind of elevating ourselves beyond our place. We're kind of putting ourselves up there close to God, and we kind of make ourselves a little mini-God. And God has no place for that. See, as followers of Jesus, it doesn't just matter what we do. It matters what we think. We need to keep these attitudes of entitlement and comparison and envy and pride. We need to keep those things in check because the thought does count. You know, you hear people all the time say, it's the thought that matters. That's a true statement. Now, usually they're using it for the wrong purpose. Usually they're saying it because they forgot to buy you a present or do something that they intended to do that was nice and good. They're saying it for the wrong reason, but it's a very true statement. It is the thought that counts. Because God sees our thoughts. 
He sees all our dirty little secrets. He sees not just what we did, but he sees why we did it. And so even if today you're not willing to look deep inside yourself and catch these attitudes that are sinful, God knows. He knows more than just what you do. He knows why you do it. Here's the good news for us on this, is Jesus sets this perfect standard, this perfect attitude that we're called to, but then he knows that we'll never quite make it, that we will always fall short. And so there's forgiveness. But don't confuse forgiveness as not being challenged to that perfect standard. You are challenged. I am challenged. So how do we do that? How do we get this attitude of Jesus so that we can look more like him and get away from entitlement and comparison and pride and envy? We follow the example of Jesus. If you want to fight entitlement, don't compare yourself to other people. Instead, serve other people like Jesus did. Just before Jesus was arrested, he and his disciples were celebrating the Passover meal. And it's what we call the Last Supper. But it was a Jewish celebration to celebrate one of the great plagues that God sent on Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave. And so this celebration, this dinner, was to celebrate the death angel passing over the the Israelites' houses and not taking their firstborn kids. And, And so they were all gathered together for this dinner meal But there was something missing that was typical part of the celebration and usually just part of dinner. There was no servant there to wash their feet. Normally before dinner, a servant would come in and clean the dirt and the grime off people's feet. And if you think about it, they all wore sandals back then and it was dusty and dirty and they walked on the same roads that horses and donkeys walked on. So they might have some little surprises on their feet from the donkeys and horses. And as you might imagine, foot washing was not... The, the best servant task. They didn't like it either. It was part of their role. And, and on this night, though, there was no servant there to wash their feet. But during the meal, Jesus gets up, he ties a towel around his waist, and he goes to his disciples, the men who followed him, and he begins to wash their feet and dry it. The apostle Peter tried to get Jesus not to wash his feet because he knew he didn't deserve to have the Messiah clean the grime off his feet, but Jesus insisted. And then after Jesus had washed the feet of every disciple and dried them off with that towel, he explained to them what he did. Look at that together. This is John 13, 12 through 17. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than the master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Jesus had been telling his apostles what it looked like to have the right attitude, to get away from entitlement, to be humble servants of one another and to the people around them. But they didn't, they never really understood. So he showed them what it looked like. And the beauty of what Jesus did is, first of all, Jesus was in a place where he had every right to be served, and yet he served in the most lowly and humble way. The other thing is, this wasn't just an example for his apostles. It's an example for us today. How many of you guys have ever been part of a foot washing ceremony, have ever done that? Yeah, a few of you. Well, this morning, you're going to get the opportunity to do that. We've got some people that are going to bring in little washcloths and some warm water, and we're going to ask everybody to take off their shoes, and as the water is passed, you're going to wash the person's feet next to you. I'm going to let you off the hook. Some of you are starting to panic. We're we're not really going to do that. Some of you were trying to figure out the subtle way to escape out the back. Yeah, there's a little clap. Yeah. We're not going to wash each other's feet this morning but I want to challenge you to think about what you were feeling just a minute ago when you thought something really crazy was about to go down in the church house. You were uncomfortable. It it made you a little nervous, maybe a lot nervous to think about washing someone else's feet. You don't really want to wash the dirt and the grime. And really, you don't want anybody touching your feet either. Some of you ladies may not have had a pedicure recently. Some of you ladies may not want anybody to see the Houston Texans logo that you had painted on your big toes. 
But when we think about that humble service, it makes us uncomfortable. That's our pride. Jesus set the example of what it looks like for us to serve one another. Jesus had told his disciples over and over and over what it looked like to have an attitude of humility, to not be entitled, to not compare, but to serve one another. They never got it until he showed them what it looked like by washing their feet and then dying on the cross. If you want to get past your attitudes of entitlement and comparison, get past the sins of envy and pride that you struggle with, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Don't compare yourself to other people. Instead, serve other people humbly like Jesus did. Let's pray.